Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you are indeed with us each and every step of the way on this journey of faith, this journey of life. We thank you that we do not travel it alone. And I thank you, O oh God, for the steps that have brought Jacqueline to us today. We thank you for the steps that you have, have uh, journeyed with her on to bring her to this place this morning so that we might hear a word from you. And so we pray, O oh God, that your anointing be upon Jacqueline now in this moment. Fill her with your spirit to overflowing and, and allow her to witness boldly to the truth of your word. And so I pray now, we pray now, oh God, that the words of her heart and the, the, the words of her lips and the meditations of her heart might be acceptable in your sight now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. Good morning. What a blessing it is to actually be here and be able to share, especially this particular telling of Jesus' appearance to two disciples on their way to Emmaus. So last week, Pastor Wayne introduce the start of a series, The Next Words, where we focus on the words of Christ after the resurrection, which started with, do not be afraid. And what stands out is how Jesus' final words spoken on the cross shows Jesus' messianic nature, his, the savior side of Jesus his fulfillment of his purpose on the cross to bring the truth about God's love and redemption to anyone who will believe and follow him. The salvation he has come to provide for everyone, the godliness of Christ. But today, I want to share with you the intimate side of Christ. So there seems to be not different, but an addition. And what's really compelling for me was that it was very personal, very directed at you and at me. It is the intimate Jesus, the one that cares about you and me, that can be seen in his interaction with these two disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke today through the question, what are you so concerned about? So it begins where on that same Sunday, two of Jesus' followers were walking to Emmaus. And it's a, about a seven-mile journey. And he came alongside them. Now, one is identified only by name. That's all we know about him, Cleopas. But the other is not identified at all. No explanation of his name or her name or what they did or who they were. But the fact that there is another disciple there, completely unidentified, faceless and nameless, could be that there was a place kind of held for us. Because I know that I can relate to looking back on my own life journey and sometimes did not realize Christ was walking alongside me. Now, these two travelers on their journey 
also encountered Jesus but didn't recognize him. And there's not really any other information given aside from the fact that it was probably intentional. But we're going to, as Pastor Wayne likes to say, parking lot that one <laughs> for now. Because this really is a focus not on the disciples, but on Jesus. Because this is really how Jesus helps us overcome our fears, uncertainty, and doubt, not through heavy-handed methods or strong-arming, but through care, patience, gentleness, and inspiration. And so Jesus enters the conversation gently, anonymously waiting for us to recognize him, but not just standing there, but engaging with us. And as he sees, as we see that he asked these disciples and shows compassion and understanding of their current situation. So let me remind you, he says, you seem, in verse 17, to be in deep discussion about something. Something's really bugging you. He said, what are you so concerned about? Now, the thing, interesting thing is, in the next passage, is when it states that they showed their sadness. So Jesus already knew their heart. They didn't show their feelings on their faces until Jesus or had already heard, read their hearts. He knew what was going on with them, but he wanted them to say what was bothering them. Think about how intimate that is. The two disciples had encountered Christ, which reminds me that Jesus says to us in Matthew 18, 20, for where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. So Jesus goes on and asks these two disciples about what they were talking about. And with the sad faces, Cleopas answers, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about the terrible things that happened there last week. Now, the crucifixion had occurred during Passover, and Jerusalem was packed full of people. And there were crosses where the public spectacle of the day had happened, and really, Everyone, especially Cleopas, assumed that everyone would know what had happened. So Cleopas recalls to Christ what had occurred, including the fact that who Jesus, who he thought Jesus was. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet powerful in the word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped, we had hoped he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. He had hoped. So, did they feel that that hope was fulfilled? No. So uh, we can kind of get a sense that there was disappointment and, well, sadness and confusion. We had hoped. Now, after hearing this, Jesus asked for more information about Jesus of Nazareth, of whom they spoke. But remember, Jesus actually liked this question quite a bit because he had asked his disciples the same question. Who do the people say I am? And then 
he asked the disciples, but who do you think I, who do you think I am? He seems to be asking, if these disciples knew who he was, who is this Jesus? And has God revealed that truth to you? Because see, Jesus is looking to see if these disciples knew his true identity. Because these disciples, they weren't the 12, the original 12, who had lived with them and taught and was taught by him, saw miracles and evidence, and have been receiving his teachings. But see, Jesus was looking for revelation in his disciples, in actually all of us. Do we know who Jesus is? But see, these two disciples still had their own ideas and didn't believe in who Jesus was. And so they said that they were willing to say that Jesus was a prophet, but the other claims that Jesus had made for himself, that he was the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of God, they had hoped it was true, but because of his death. And because they did not see the resurrection themselves, they still had doubt and fear and uncertainty. Now, it's understandable because, you know, when you discover your hopes have been misplaced, what happens to us? Sometimes we don't dare to hope because we don't want to be disappointed and we start to despair. But Jesus had predicted his resurrection and there were eyewitnesses to that that testified to it. But they did not see it themselves and so they chose not to believe he was alive. And so he said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now, that was Jesus' wake-up call. It wasn't really him trying to insult them. Instead, the word foolish, anatos, means not understanding. So he was telling them, you, you don't get it. But I think the harsher statement that he made was the fact that they were slow to believe. We would assume they believed some of what the prophets were saying, but not everything. And sometimes we pick and choose what to believe, don't we? And so Jesus points out the problem but see, he doesn't say, mm -mm. he doesn't wiggle a finger, he doesn't accuse. What he does is he points it out, and then he goes and teaches them. He doesn't leave us hanging in our spiritual despair, because that is not our Christ. That is not our Savior. Our Savior doesn't leave us hopeless. He saves us with hope. And because he goes to show these disciples and us how to move beyond our difficulty believing and our spiritual blindness. Those who waited for the Messiah to deliver them from oppression had difficulty accepting the fact that Messiah, that the Messiah would come in anything other than glory and power. And that's part of our challenge sometimes, that God constantly teaches us, expect the unexpected. It's not always going to happen 
the way you think it's going to happen for your benefit. But see, that's the whole thing. God, God's curveballs aren't actually curveballs. What they are is the perfect of things. And we, as imperfect, have a hard time sometimes grasping that. And so we have room in our lives to insert faith that allows us to then be able to expect the unexpected, to be able to be open to what God provides us. And so Jesus explains to them why Christ had to suffer these things. And he does that in the most amazing way, which is through the word of God. Through the word of God. Jesus' personal presence and the word of God. That is the key. But even though, okay, so even though he explained all these things in scripture, they still didn't recognize him. Because I think there's something else important that I want to share with you that these two disciples did do right. So the three travelers were approaching Emmaus and Jesus acted as if he were going farther. Why would he do that? Is he doing that to trick them, to test them? No. Was he doing that because he was tired of them? Because they he had opened up the scriptures to them and they still didn't recognize who he was? No. Because remember, Jesus doesn't strong arm. He doesn't force. And so he was waiting for an invitation. He's waiting for our invitation. So when they reached their intended destination, Jesus would have gone on had they not strongly. Notice in scripture it says strongly earnestly asked him to stay with them. God wants everyone to come to salvation, but he doesn't force himself on anyone, and he creates us with the blessing and the responsibility of free will. And so Jesus knocks at the door of our lives and waits outside to be invited in. So when he was invited, he went on to stay with them. And see, the thing is, Jesus always responds to the invitation to spend time with us. It's just a matter of whether or not we take the time to invite him. But he always has time for us. You'll never be disappointed. And so as they settled in for the evening... They gathered around the table and just Jesus took the bread and gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them when all of a sudden he disappeared. And these two, these two disciples then realized who he was when he broke the bread. And as soon as they realized that, he disappeared. And then they started thinking back. Weren't our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures? Were not our hearts burning? But see, they didn't just sit there and go, hmm, wow, that was an incredible experience. They got up. And remember, they walked. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. And see, I think one of the incredible things is that 
when our hearts are burning like that, when we encounter Christ, that we go out and actually share that encounter, that we go out and take action. Something happens, that burning heart causes us to go. And so they got up at once, went back to Jerusalem. His disappearance was abrupt, yes, as was his appearance. Because remember, he just started walking with them. He stepped into the middle of their conversation. It's not as if he had sent people ahead or whether or not they were ready. No, because sometimes our encounters with Christ is when we least expect it. It's not when we know it's going to happen all the time. And so how important is it that we are then open to that experience? Something happened to them. They found the renewed excitement about Revelation, and they went. And see, something happens to us when we have these moments, when we recognize Jesus in our lives. And I hope we are also compelled to move and share our experience about Jesus. Amen. Thank you for the reading of your word. And we thank you for the proclamation of your word. We thank you for the truth of this word that has gone out. Not only here in this place, but those that have gathered online to hear, to hear what you would say to us as we encounter you on our Emmaus Road journey. And we thank you that as we travel, even though we might not recognize you right away, we thank you, O oh God, for those times when our hearts burn within us and that we recognize you. as we invite you in to fellowship with us. Because in the waiting, in the searching, in the healing, in the hurting, in the blessing, every minute, every moment, no matter where we've been or where we're going, even when we didn't know it or couldn't see it,
go forward and out into the world and journey down the road. Believe in Jesus. Open up the word of God and let Jesus talk to you and show you the truth so that your hearts can burn inside of you. Let us become people whose eyes have been opened to the truth and our hearts be filled with desire to share the feeling and understanding of inspired hope that comes from realizing that Jesus is here, waiting to be invited into our lives. May God bless you and keep you. May the Holy Spirit pour his grace down upon you. And may you realize Jesus is with you. Amen. So today I have the honor of being able to greet you by the door. And remember that the prayer team is here to pray with you and for you. I'll see you in the mud room. God bless. <laughs>